In the vast realms of the digital cosmos, where the lines between reality and illusion blur, everyday people on social media dares to post content challenging our conventional ways of thinking, providing evidence and questions that challenges our reality and suggests alternative ways of looking at things. What you thought you knew is cast into doubt, and what you've never seen becomes the canvas of possibility. And sometimes, I like to wander away from the creepy and horrors out there that might give you chills and focus on the bizarre and questionable to get your mind juices to flow from your everyday realities. Nothing in particular, just random videos I came across as of late. Reality is but a canvas and the mind the paintbrush. Let's delve into the unexplored realms of thought together. And, as always, your comments, thoughts, and opinions are welcome and motivates me to push out more. Subscribe, like, and share for more content just like this. It's fascinating how a simple fire pit can become a magical hub for fairies. So it started out with this, it was supposed to be a fire pit, and then a mushroom started growing around it. Mushrooms could have gone anywhere. Giant yard. Right? Giant yard. Could have gone anywhere. Yep. And no mushrooms. But then once she started building a fire pit, some fairies decided that, oh, it's a gift. It's supposed to be a community center. So mushrooms started growing. So we decided to help build this community better. So we're putting rocks around it. We're gonna make this a little teepee hut. We're gonna put some more colors, and it's gonna be a nice fairy garden. Fairies make their home in a fire pit, but something unexpected happens when a mushroom sprouts nearby. They see it as a sign and decide to transform it into a community center. Rocks are gathered, colors are added, and a magical fairy garden begins to take shape. This tale of fairies and mushrooms unfolding in a giant yard creates a mysterious and enchanting atmosphere. It raises questions about the origin of the fairies and their purpose in building a community center. What led them to choose this particular spot and what other secrets might this garden hide? What do you think might have attracted the fairies to the fire pit in the first place? Could there be a deeper connection between the mushrooms and the fairies' intentions? This story reminds us to always look for the unexpected and embrace the enchantment that can be found in everyday moments. The conversation reveals a belief in a conspiracy theory that the moon landing was fate. Hollywood did the moon landings for NASA. If one picture proved, proves it, sir, right here. How? Talk to me, talk to me, talk two to me. Two guys playing golf, one, two. It's intriguing how the individual questions various aspects like the camera button, rover tracks, and the flatness of the Earth. Third guy always stayed in the orbiter 60 miles up, so who pushed the button on the camera to take the picture? Maybe it was time No lap. timer, no remote shutter. Who pushed the button on Damn. the camera? F-A-K-E, sir. Here's the rover. Lots of footprints. No tire tracks. How'd the rover get there without leaving tire tracks, sir? F-A-K-E, sir. But you know why they faked the moon landing? Why they fake it? To beat the Russians and to give us the first pictures of this. And they lied again because it's flat. What? And watch this, sir. The boats are not upside down, sir. <laughs> oh, so the boats are not sideways because the, the water's flat. You think the and earth see is flat? the kangaroos, sir? What about kangaroos? They're not upside down because the earth is flat. How's the earth Duh. flat? How, what are, so explain the sun movement. The sun's doing circles over the flat earth, sir. So <laughs> explain when there's hills and the sun gets blocked by the hills. Does it just instantly get cold? Well, it blocks the sunlight. The sunlight's hot. So, so if the sun was to fly over and it got blocked but right the here, it'd be cold right here. You know why they call them airplane? Because they fly in the air over the plane. Oh my god. That's called language. Oh my sir. god. And the boats are not upside down or sideways because it's flat. Duh. So where's the ending to the water if the water's flat? The white beach, Antarctica. The white beach. The white beach, Antarctica. The, the blue dome's at the edge. So if the sun rises all over there all the time. Oh shit. <laughs> You've been moving on a flat earth your whole life. You just didn't know it, sir. This, flat earth gravity. We're on a, we're actually on a hill. 
Oh my God. We are on a The hill. water's flat. Well, and the boats it? are not upside down, sir. What? Gravity. No, it's gravity like, pulls it's us like down. global bullshit, sir. Gra gravity pulls us down. To the flat earth, yeah. Yeah. But nobody's upside down. Duh. What evidence supports the claim that the moon landing was fake? It's fascinating how this discussion challenges widely accepted beliefs and prompts us to question the information we receive. The world's first heartless man. Y'all, this is Craig Lewis. Basically, they replaced this man's heart with a pump. This man was giving days to a few hours to live. He was admitted to the hospital with amyloidosis. This can cause kidney, liver, and heart failure. Basically, if the doctors didn't step in when they did, he would have died in hours to days. Two doctors from the Texas Heart Institute came up with a revolutionary idea. After the surgery, he was still legally dead. No pulse, but breathing and talking. He ended up going home seven days after this procedure and he's still alive today. Anybody thinking what I'm thinking? AI <coughs> clone. <clears throat> We're just hearing about this now, but it's been going on forever. They replaced a man's heart with a pump, and he miraculously survived. The narrator suggests that this raises questions about cloning and the possibility that humans can live without a heart. So, if he can live without a heart, maybe it's because they can just make people? This passage raises intriguing ideas about the potential capabilities of humans and the true nature of our existence. All right, the moon is moving in the sky. It's running away from this craft. I don't even know what that is. Look at that, I'm standing still. I'm leaving my camera still. That's the moon moving away. And that thing's chasing it. If I sit still, look, the moon runs away from my camera. I'll put it all the way over here and watch. The moon is running away. It's the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's running away from this craft. It almost seems like it's changing directions, like it's not going straight. Somebody tell me what's going on here. I've never seen this before. The moon is literally running away from that thing. Holy freaking cow. The moon is moving away from a mysterious craft, leaving the observer scared and curious about what is happening. This passage creates a sense of foreboding and mystery, with the moon behaving unusually and the observer feeling frightened by the situation. What could possibly be causing the moon to run away from the craft, and why does it appear to be changing directions? The unknown and unexplained can be both thrilling and terrifying, leaving us with a deep sense of curiosity and wonder. The narrator is asking Terence about the concept of multiplication and how one times one can equal one. They discuss actions, reactions, and the idea that equanimity is the currency of the universe. The narrator implies that the current understanding of math has been programmed with lies and that fundamental concepts are flawed. Opinion. Out? What's one times one? One times one is one. To multiply means to do what? To make more, right? Yes. Increase the number? Yes. Multiply? Yes. How can one times one equaling one be part of the multiplication table? It fails to satisfy the term multiply. It doesn't multiply. Does it? What's an action times an action? You got some weed. I know, no, I'm asking you. <laughs> Honestly, what I'm asking you. Reason, reason, <laughs> reason, reason, reason. I want you to reason. <laughs> I don't know. What's an action times an action? A reaction, right? Okay. Have you ever seen an action times an action without a reaction? Have you? No, because every because equanimity is the currency of the universe. There's always an action times an action, a reaction having a reaction. So how can one times one equal one? How can a times b just be a? It creates a foreboding atmosphere by suggesting that what we know might not be entirely accurate. This is the beginning of, of, of our understanding. It should fit. What kind of calculator you got? What kind of phone you got? An iPhone? iPhone? Okay, go to your calculator. Whatever the new one. No, go to okay. your calculator. Go to your calculator. All right. 
<laughs> Go to calculator. Go to calculator. Yeah, you I got do you. too. You got iPhone? What are we doing? I want both of y'all to do two separate things. I want to do the same thing to start with. Turn it to the side. Okay. All right. Now I want you to both hit the number two that the whole calculator show up. Hit number what? Hit the number two. Number two. two. Go to the square root. It is the second column from the left, third row. It'll have that square yeah. thing. All right. 1.4. 1.414213563793095. 1. 1. Yeah. Holy crap. Now I want you two to do two separate things now. <laughs> two separate things. I want you to multiply it by two, hit times two, equal, don't you do it. Okay. And I want you to hit X to the third. X to the third. It's going to be. Times third. three? No, X to the third. Oh, X. Oh, okay. I see it. I see it. X to the third. Yeah, I got you. All right. 1.1. 1. No. 1. You didn't hit X to the third. Yes, I did. If you hit X to the third. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. So I go did back that. again. Okay, you so now. Here's where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm two, good. Two. Square root. Square root. And hit X to the third. All right, 2.82. 2 2 2174 the same value you got. Yeah. By multiplying it by two. Yeah. And he just cubed it. Divide it by two again. Both of y'all. Divide, divide by two. Divide it by two. No, divide by two. <laughs> hit equal. Now, cube it again. Hit X to the third. Yeah. You see that loop? Yeah. That's saying X cubed is equal to 2X, which is equal to X plus X. That's an unnatural equation. That's a mathematical fallacy. And that's the beginning of your math. That's how I invented tangential flight because your math, someone programmed that lie in there. And this conversation challenges conventional thinking, encouraging a deeper examination of fundamental concepts. In this video, the person explains that fruits or vegetables with a sticker and a number starting with four are considered GMOs, which means they were created in a lab. What's up, TikTok? So, any fruits or vegetables that have a sticker and their number starts with four means it's a GMO, meaning it was created in a laboratory, not from a tree or ground or whatever it comes from. And so to prove that, I sliced the banana in half with this knife. And as you can see, there are no seeds. As you can see, they show a banana without seeds and discuss how seedless fruits can still be called non go. And people were tripping on the fact that these bananas no longer have any seeds whatsoever. Why was this guy calling this a GMO? We have to understand when they render something seedless, they can still call it non GMO. This video brings awareness to the complex world of genetically modified foods. Who is showing his banana with seeds in it, and people are tripping out because they've never seen a banana with seeds after all these years of eating bananas. So this other guy was considering this banana a GMO because there's no seeds. There's not even any more black spots like there used to be. There's nothing left in this plant. It is now a sterile hybrid mule sugar fruit. But they still call these bananas non-GMO. Do you guys see the trick here? Did you know that exploding seedless watermelons are non-GMO? It also raises an important question about how GMOs are defined and labeled. With a chemical called colchicine is considered non-GMO. Right here, I always prove what I'm saying. A chemical called colchicine is rendering these watermelons seedless. The watermelon version of a mule right here a seedless watermelon is not a genetically modified food if you think it is fair for seedless fruits to be called non-gmo even though they are created through selective breeding or chemical processes Our DNA has a unique song that resonates with us. When that song is played, our DNA celebrates and tightens, pushing out everything else. It suggests that there is a deep connection between music and our genetic makeup. It also raises the question of how this knowledge can be used to better understand and heal our bodies. Guess what hydrogen sounds like? It's a key of E, and it's a color yellow. That's what 
proper physics gets you to. Oxygen is a chartreuse and it's the key of F over F sharp. Now they used it, like I said, information used to be thought about as just electrical information passing on. But I've got a question for you. Have you ever been at a party with some of your friends you ain't seen in 10 years, but y'all was like 14, you hung out and there's a song that came on and you're like, ah, and everybody got up and was live at that moment. Now say 10 years later, you got a friend with you. He's a good guy, but he wasn't there when me and my boys formed this. So when that song comes on, our DNA tightens, tightens, tightens. There's a particular song, a scale in the genome for each and every one of us. Now, when that song is played, when your particular prime resonant frequency is played, guess what happens? Your DNA celebrates and tightens. Everything else gets pushed out. Harmonic wave resequencing. The carbon is also the key of E and yellow. The nitrogen is G. And all these play a song. So say that the F over F sharps of the oxygen, the green, is only hitting at an, an F. Why? Because there's another frequency coming in from a generator over there. That's changing and causing it to change. The F hits a carbon. So the, instead of hitting as an F sharp, it hits as an F, so when it hits the carbon at an E, it doesn't hit it quite right, so the domino don't file right. So the next domino hits wrong. And so now we have a uh, malformation happening within our DNA because the frequencies are being pushed off. But when we hear our tone, we tighten back up. So yeah, I am in the process of building the harmonic wave resequencer with another doctor who has been able to successfully cure AIDS and cancer and it's well underway. But I wanted you guys to understand how that works. It's so simple. You do not need to tear the human body apart when all you can do is use frequency to bring it back to its normal space. How does the harmonic wave resequencer work? And how does it use frequency to bring the human body back to its normal state? It's fascinating to think that something as simple as frequency can have such a profound impact on our well-being. Exploring the connections between music, DNA, and healing opens up a whole new realm of possibilities for improving human health.